Hello, my name is Claire Michkowski, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. We'd like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Dole Institute. Our friends help keep our programs free and open and support archive research and our student activities. Please contact, please contact us if you are interested. Before we begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the presentation, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rich Barbuto. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the eighth presentation in our lecture series on military innovation. Today's presentation is on strategic bombing. Mark Hull is an associate professor at the United States Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he teaches both war crimes law and history courses. He earned his undergraduate degree from the Citadel, his doctorate from the University College Cork in Ireland, and his Juris Doctorate from the Cumberland School of Law. Mark is also an elected fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Dr. Hull was honored this year with his selection as the Educator of the Year for the History Department at Command and General Staff College. Prior to teaching at the Command and General Staff College, Dr. Hull worked as a criminal prosecutor. He served in Iraq as a Brigade Intelligence Advisor to the Army's 1st Infantry Division Military Transition Team from 2006 to 2007. His books include Irish Secrets, German Espionage in Wartime Ireland. Next year, the University of Oklahoma Press will publish By the Light of the Shadows, Treason, Holocaust, and a Myth of Irish Identity. Mark's current research focus is the Nuremberg Trials. Finally, Mark is the proud owner of a very temperamental 1965 Jaguar MK2. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mark Hall. Uh, welcome. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to Rich for that over overly generous introduction. Um, now, secondly, if you all will behave yourselves, this should take no more than about three hours. So let's, let's move along. Uh, my take on strategic bombing may be a little untraditional, in a sense. And I want to start this out with a short video. It's going to last about two minutes, but I'd like you to have a look at it, and let's talk about it right afterward. Oh, come 
Uh, that is the trailer to what is said is going to be the next of the Band of Brothers series. About the eighth, it's going to be about the Eighth Air Force over Europe in 1943, 44, 45. The reason I showed that to you is the talk. What we're going to be discussing today is not to me so much about the technology or about any of this. It's about the 17, 18, 19 year olds that were flying these planes in 1943 and 44 and 45. I think that does a fair job of giving you that vista. And there are a lot of different ways you can do this. I mean, we can have a highly technical talk and talk about aircraft specifications and about different mission sets. And I, I don't want to do that. And I hope you don't either. Some numbers that may surprise you. 14,903 air crew lost, 13,873 aircraft lost. 52,651 accidents, except that all happened in training in the United States between December 1941 and May 1945. So these are people killed. These are tens of thousands of aircraft lost, um, tens of thousands of accidents and none of it had to do with dropping a bomb on Germany in the sense that they were in, in, in on mission. This is an incredibly expensive endeavor in terms of money. 25% of the U.S. defense budget in World War II goes into aviation. It is an incredibly expensive endeavor in terms of the lives lost and affected on the ground and in the air. A thousand planes just went away. Don't know what happened. 18,418 lost to Luftwaffe or Flak. Lost 40,000 killed in action, another 12,000 missing, which is kind of a funny reverse because normally, generally speaking, well, in terms of wounded in the air, in Army aviation, more are killed than wounded. And normally it's three to one, three wounded for every killed, but not in the air war. 45,581 aircraft lost, of which about half were lost in co direct combat related, meaning again they're shot down by enemy fire. The story of how this comes about, you can even take it as far back as Jules Verne in the 1880s. Uh, he writes about the, one of the first books uh, called Rober the Conqueror, which I think probably nobody's ever read, but I mean I finally had to go read it. But the idea of what aircraft were and what they're capable of doing. 
this came to a head sort of in World War I uh, when the Germans started launching airship raids, uh, bombing raids against England, uh, 1915, 16, 17, and 18, and specifically a German airship commander named Peter Strasser, who is thinking through the process of how you can take an airframe of any kind and put bombs on it and send it to some place to attack not just throw bombs at random, but throw bombs at targets that are going to have some kind of effect. If you throw bombs at random, you may scare some people, but in terms of the cost-benefit of the crews and the airframes, and the Germans are going to lose you know, some airships, is there a way that you can make this like a domino set? That if I drop this, the next, the next, the next, and is this a predictable kind of a thing? And maybe you can win the war. That if you can set the dominoes up the right way, or you can discover that they're set up the right way, and you can affect the first one, is there a way that you can have an effect that you intend at the very end of this thing? And World War I, we're trying things out. We're doing Zeppelin raids in England. Uh, they're launching mammoth bombers, Gothos from the Germans, and uh, Handley Page bombers from England. You can see the size of some of the ordnance that they're dropping. Um, it's crude, it's not accurate, and they haven't worked out all the problems yet. But people are thinking about the problems and, and wondering if this is something, in the future, as technology improves, is this something that we can really do? Which brings us to two very early theorists. One of them you've probably heard about especially if you're a Gary Cooper movie fan. Uh, the other, maybe not. Uh, the guy on the left is Giulio Douay. He's an Italian officer. Uh, he has the distinction of piloting the aircraft that first dropped a bomb on civilians mm. in Libya. Mm. He's probably the most important theorist of air warfare. Uh, he writes a book. And his book is read first in Italian, then it's translated. And one of the people that reads his book and takes it to heart is the guy on the right-hand side, who, of course, is Billy Mitchell. Um, now, this, the thing with the theory is kind of interesting, because we're going to start very early on with Douay getting into some areas that probably make people uncomfortable. And they should. So, again, writing in 1921, Douay is saying things like, uh, our targets should properly be civilians. Civilian towns, civilian buildings, civilian infrastructure, civilians, people. And further, to accomplish this mission, we should be ready to employ explosive, incendiary, and poison gas. And the idea is we need to kill as many civilians as we possibly can. Because, why do you suppose? Think about the dominoes. That this is sort of, and we call this the center, of, one of the centers of gravity, or at the center of gravity. And Douay's idea here is that if I can affect the civilian population and make them cry uncle, I'm going to win the war. They will force an end to the war by their government. And further, if I do this properly, I don't need an army, and I don't need a navy. All I need is a bunch of bombers hitting civilian populations of sufficient size to cause an effect, the dominoes. Now, his theories, there, there are more sophisticated parts to that, but that's, in essence, what it is. And further, he's erasing, in theory, this distinction that we've had at least for a while of the difference between people, the combatants and non-combatants. Dewey says here, uh, everyone takes part, everyone is a proper target. The person who works in the factory is just as much of an enemy combatant as the person with a rifle, you know, across the trench line. Whether that makes sense to you or you think that's right is, is another issue. So, when we start playing this out, and this is something we're going to be talking about when we get to World War II, would you agree that if I'm flying my bomber, 
like this B-17 we saw in the clip, and I see an enemy Messerschmitt fighter, that that's a proper target. I should be able to shoot at it. Yeah. Okay, probably. Um, what about the factory where the fighters are made? Is that a proper yeah. target? Yep. Okay. Uh, what about the house in the town where the guy that works in the factory lives who makes the fighter that, that's attacking my bomber? What about that? Is that a proper target? What about the family of the guy that lives in the house, that works in the factory, that makes the fighter that's flying against my bomber? Are they proper targets? Can I intentionally kill them? Well, that's not an easy question, and it's one that they're going to have to struggle with. Billy Mitchell is a, an advocate. The, he's seen by a lot of people as a prophet. Uh, he's also kind of a jerk, which is that Billy Mitchell, as, with a lot of foresight, the foresight that he had, also had an almost uncanny ability just to make enemies. I mean, he went out of his way to pick fights he didn't need, need to pick, um, which is, among other things, the reason he gets court-martialed and Gary Cooper makes a movie about him. Uh, Mitchell believes early on that the thing that we need most of all, because Mitchell is an aviator and he's a commander of aviators, is we need an independent air force. And if you had to predict who Mitchell thinks is probably the best person on earth to command that organization, who would you think? <laughs> he believes that we can use air power to strategic effect, and that's our key word, member for this talk, strategic bombardment. And by this I mean absolute, pure, strategic. It will win the war. And that if we have an independent air force that has strategic effect capability, uh, we don't need the Navy. So this is yet another fight that he picks with the Navy, who's, who are experimenting with aviation just like the Army is. Um, and for that matter, if we have an independent air force, we don't really need the Army. Although Mitchell, and, here, here, and here's where you get kind of a problem with, with the court-martial thing, because as, a, as an Army officer, when you're advocating, that, that's not going to go well. And finally, you know, Mitchell being, being bold. I just made that up. I'm kidding. He didn't really say that. See, I, I do these things to see if you're paying attention, because if you're not paying attention, we go longer. Okay, so, so just... <laughs> In 19, the middle 1930s, uh, the Army Air Corps uh, in Maxwell Field, Alabama, sat down to do some of the hard math and doctrine to try to figure out if we can do this, what's it going to have to look like? And they came up with a list of what are called, we're calling key assumptions. And here's the catch. For this theory to work, strategic bombardment, taking airplanes with bombs and sending them someplace to have a strategic effect when the war knocked the dominoes down, these things are going to have to be true. The degree to which you have any of them not true can be catastrophic. At the very least, it's going to be expensive. So theory, point number one is, are there vital targets in an enemy economy? Which, okay, most economies, at least Western European industrialized economies, would you say this is probably going to be true, assuming we're fighting one of those people? Yes. That there are vital points in that economy? Yes. Okay. So, green light. That further, you can identify where these are. That may be a little more problematic, because you can know that they exist, but maybe your information is outdated. Um, if it's 1943 and you're trying to find where the German ball bearing production facilities are and you know where they were back in 1941, well, you could drop a guy in and have him ask around, you know, <laughs> just, hey, you know, where's, where's, where, where's the ball bearing production facilities? And of course, that's not going to go great in, in Nazi Germany. Um, but 
in theory, it, you should be able to do this at least to within a reasonable degree of certainty. Third, that even if, okay, they have to exist, I can identify them, and further, that those targets have to be vulnerable to precision bombing. Because they can exist, but if they have a steel dome that's 40 feet high surrounding them, it doesn't make any difference if, you can, if they exist and you can identify them. Thirdly, that unescorted bombers can penetrate enemy air defenses. Because at the time this theory is being developed, uh, we have a cool new prototype aircraft called the Boeing 299 that eventually is going to grow up to be the Boeing B-17. But there is no fighter in the world that can accompany bombers on, on long-range missions. And the Boeing, the, the 299, the B-17, are, it's incredibly fast for its time. And the standard was it needed to go at least 200 miles an hour, and it exceeds that. The problem is, if that's true in 1935, and we don't actually put these things into action until 1942, times have changed. Can the bombers bomb the target accurately? Because remember, these are interlock concepts, because you have, they have to exist, have to be identified, have to be vulnerable to precision bombing. The bomber has to get through, and once it does get through, it has to be able to destroy the target. Not kind of the target, it has to really to be able to hit the thing. Can you bomb it enough times? And the enemy will have no effective countermeasures, which you're assuming is going to be fine because your bomber can fly the B-17 so high and so fast, and it carries a very heavy bomb load when it's designed. The Germans aren't going to cooperate with this one. <laughs> um, and if you'd been fighting somebody else, maybe it would have turned out just fine. But the, the Germans, uh, they're, they're kind of good at some things here. And one of them is fighter defense and, and integrated air defense. The problem, though, is we're dealing with a lot of moving pieces in the sense that even as something as basic to this concept as targeting, getting the bomb on the target you want to get it onto, from 3,000 feet, you got a 64% chance, testing shows, uh, which would maybe be OK if you're flying at 3,000 feet, but you're not going to. 19% accuracy at 10,000 feet, which might be OK if you're flying at 10,000 feet, but you're not going to. I'm sorry. Um, and the sad percentage here is that by, even by 1944, by 1945, your chances of getting a bomb on a target within 1,000 yards is 10% flying from the altitude they're flying at. So if only 10% of your munitions are actually hitting the target you needed to hit, <coughs> that, that also could be problematic. Now, that's even assuming that there's no bad guys, but just the fact, just getting the bomb on the target. Uh, and further, by 1932, the Air Force believed that they could hit targets in almost any weather. Anybody ever been to Germany? You ever been to Germany in the winter? If you had to pick a color to describe the sky, what would the color be? Yeah, it wouldn't be blue. It would be gray, which means overcast, which means if you're 25,000 feet up in the air and you're dropping a something, you can't, um, OK. The Americans and the British developed two different <laughs> strategies for dealing with Germany once, of course, Britain comes into the war in 39 and we get in in 41. Because the Germans chew up British bombers early in the war, the British soon realized this idea of precision bombing just isn't going to work for them. And early on, they adopt, 1942 mostly, the idea instead of, of area bombing, meaning I don't have to worry about being precise if I destroy all of it. Instead of building number three, I take out the town, including building number three. Now, there's a lot of math that has to go into this. You need a lot of bombers. You need a lot of bombs. You need a, some kind of navigation system. Um, the British find out early that if they try to do this kind of stuff during daylight, their bombers get chewed up by, by the Germans very badly. 
So they switch on very quickly to night bombing, which presents a whole other series of challenges. If you're flying over to find a target at night in a country that knows that's what you're trying to do, uh, you're essentially doing dead reckoning. You're flying this course at this speed for this long, and you hope that you get somewhere near the target you want to destroy. It gets more sophisticated, but it, it's a problem. The Americans, on the other hand, are believers in this initial system of precision daylight bombing. B-17 centric, B-17 is going to be self, a perfect self-defense box or device. It can fly at distance, it can drop ordnance on the target, it can destroy the target, and we do this enough times, we win the war. There's a cartoon in Collier's Magazine in 1942, which reinforces the public line the Army Air Force has, that you can drop a bomb from a B-17 using the Norden bomb site into a pickle barrel. You can't. No. no, no. You may be able to blow up like a half, the half mile radius of the pickle barrel and also get the pickle barrel, but the idea here that you, can, you have that kind of accuracy, it just doesn't exist. <coughs> and if you're bombing Hamburg at nighttime, uh, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, Now, the way these things work when you're talking about a bomber formation, a bomber boxes, B-17s, and later B-24s, 25s, you're stacking bombers uh, laterally, and you're also stacking them horizontally. So bomber here, bomber here, you have what's called an aiming point, and this is the thing you want to hit. You start a bomb run, you proceed. Uh, the way the Norden bomb site works is actually it, it has a, a separate device inside of it, and, and the bomb, bombardier is actually flying the airplane. It goes like on an autopilot. You hit the target, you drop your bombs, you hope for the best. But even from the simple model, if you're the left or right aircraft, how much chance do you think you have about hitting that little blue, blue triangle? You can't. This comes to a head when we start making deeper penetration raids over Germany in 1943. Uh, Eighth Air Force launches two major raids toward the, to, in the fall of 1943, and they are very bad. Um, we attack the Schweinfurt Regensburg raid on 17 August, and the idea is that you send these two, raid, two groups, many groups of bombers, attacking two separate targets and you stagger them so the Germans are refueling their planes when the second group comes through to hit the target again. The timing was off. They didn't get it right. So you get every German fighter that they can pull attacking both sets of groups, plus flak. The losses, uh, both on the first raid, which are bad, and then on the second raid, which are even worse in some ways, you're losing 25% of the bomber force which means, in effect, that if you fly four raids and have similar rates of loss, you've attrited 100% of your bomber force, for, and nothing to show for it. Uh, they have no idea if they've destroyed the target at Schweinfurt, and they haven't, or the Messerschmitt plant at Regensburg. Now, one of the things with bombing and crew loss, and I, and I want to talk about this just for a second because we could really, there's some cool stuff going on here and we could do more of it, is the nature of psychological casualties in the Army Air Forces and how it was treated. One of the things they, they realized after a while when the crew started taking significant losses in 1943 was that aviators show this kind of psychological stress in a different way than the people on the ground. They show it in terms of phobias, often. Uh, the American procedure was if you had a crew member on a B-17 that refused to go into the aircraft because they had just could not do this another time, uh, the point was to, to take the entire crew out of rotation and put them someplace that, that's away from fighting 
and try to work with them to get them back and into the action. The British, on the other hand, thought it was exactly the opposite. If you had a crew member in the Royal Air Force who could not get into his aircraft, gunner, bomber, pilot, doesn't matter, uh, the British would literally get out a rubber stamp that has uh, LMF on it and slap that on top of your personnel file. LMF meant lack of moral fiber. It's a disease, they believe. And if you let one crewman start it and you keep them in the unit, it's going to spread like a, like a communicable disease. So you get them out. You, you, they will never, ever, ever return to flight status. And these two very different approaches to what are essentially the same problem, how do you take young men who are 17, 18, 19 and put them in situations where I fly today, we lose three aircraft, and with a B-17, the math is easy because it's 10 people on a crew. So the guy that was on my softball team, he's dead. The guy that has the bunk across the way, he's dead. And so are, you know, 27 others. And, and you watch them get blown out of the sky. And then you don't fly for two days because of rain. And then you fly again, and you don't lose anybody. And then you fly the next day, and you lose 10. I mean, the random, unpredictable, almost like Olympian God kind of punishment that's coming out of these people, it's, it's impossible to condition them beyond a certain point, and it's a huge thing that not a lot of people talk about. Um, 1943, 44, the average bomber lifespan, and again, this is the bomber, not the crew, uh, is 225 days from the day that bomber is born. Right? Um, the Schweinfurt Regensburg and then the Schweinfurt raids are traumatic and it's apparent that as much as people in the Army Air Force need this thing to work because everything is riding on it. It has to work. Even if it, even if it doesn't seem to be, it is imperative that it will. So how do you adjust the, the players here or the math to try to get this thing to do the thing you had promised that it would? Strategic effect by bombardment. And how can you get it done before you run out of people? I, I can't even imagine what it's like to, to go through a flak field, which is totally random death. Pieces of hot metal coming through your aircraft. There is not a thing in the world you can do about it, especially if you're on the bomb run, and you just take it. Part of the problem was for the bomber concept was the short range of most American fighters early in the war. So even the P-47, okay, which was an incredibly cool aircraft and a very effective fighter, it did not have the range to take the bombers all the way into deep penetration raids in Germany and bring them back. So you can see from the map here, if it's past Frankfurt, uh, you're, you're kind of on your own. How do you fix that? Well use our friend the drop tank um, with new kinds of aircraft that are coming on the line as we get through into 44, which is the P-51 Mustang and the P-38 Lightning. Longer range with drop tank, which curiously they made cars out of these after the war. Um, that's the P-51, which was uh, just apparently a, an incredible fighter aircraft you can go all the way to Vienna, pretty much anywhere in Central Europe you want to go to. We now have fighter escorts that can take the bombers there. And they're going to make a decision because after Schweinfurt Regensburg, they ground the bomber fleet until they can figure out what to do about it. And what they're going to do is wait. And they're going to wait until February 1944 when now the fighters can take the bombers and escort them all the way to the target and back home. And they're going to take on a new mission, and the new mission is instead of focusing on just the strategic aspects of hitting German industry, so ball bearings and oil production and electricity grids and railroad yards, uh, the new mission of the 8th Air Force Fighter Command is going to be to destroy the German Luftwaffe in the air. And we've got a lot more planes than they do. Uh, the Germans had some of the highest skilled fighter pilots in the world by 43. Uh, they really were very good. Uh, by 44, most of them are dead. 
And even though German aircraft production ironically goes up in 44 and even into 45, uh, the skilled pilots to, to fly the Wolfs or the Messerschmitts, they're, they're not there anymore. So again, by kind of turning the thing a little to the side, the theory, uh, we have found a way, the innovation piece, to make this thing work for us. So big week, uh, Luftwaffe gets, gets blasted. Uh, we continue to, add to, to attack the, the facilities that are necessary to make the Luftwaffe function. Synthetic fuel, fuel, aircraft production, ball bearings. And ball bearings is kind of a cool thing. Uh, it did not work out completely because we never did really knock the German capability out. But the theory is very elegant. And it's simple, which is, what's the lowest common denominator thing of yours I can take away, and what are the effects of that? And you think of like a steel marble, okay, how's that going to send the entire German war industry t to a standstill? That's well, pretty easy, right? If you don't have friction bearings, what can't you do? Anything that turns, any engine, any, any, so German airplanes, German tanks, German anti-aircraft systems, German locomotives, any, anything, anything that's modern and mechanized has a friction bearing, at least in 44, 45. So if I deny them the capability to produce them, and they can't readily buy them, maybe from Sweden, which they kind of did, uh, I, it's my strategic bombing thing realized. But it's going to be hard, and it's going to be hard to assess the, the damage. Big week hurts us in terms of aircraft because this is not a cost-free process. So to hit these specific targets, to fly against German fighters day after day after day after day is expensive, but we win the attritional war for fighter supremacy. <coughs> Excuse me. So Luftwaffe gets hurt. Um, German fighter production is down temporarily as a result of these attacks, although it will rebound. But the, again, the problem is even if you make more fighters and you don't have the fuel to put in them and you don't have the pilots to put in them, it doesn't make any difference how many planes you make. So that's just a, uh, the bombing survey that shows as the war goes on, Germany's making more planes, but to no effect. Because of the difficulties with the Norden bomb site in terms of actually getting or, uh, the bombs on target, uh, the Army concludes that they have methods by 1944 that allows them to do what is called blind bombing. Bombing through clouds, even though I can't physically see the target, are there ways to actually get the bombers and over, over them? Um, it, it didn't work well. Uh, again, 30% of the bombing, even on good, good days, uh, within 1,000 feet of the aiming point. And after the war, in a very, this is a, you're never ever going to hear this happening again. The Air Force does a survey at the end of the war to assess the effectiveness of, of the bombing campaign. And this is going to totally blow you away. They tell the truth. <laughs> When's the last time you ever heard a military thing like that? Like where you're just going to say, unvarnished, okay, if it didn't work, you're going to say it didn't work. Uh, that's, I mean, I, w I was commissioned in the Army in 1984, and I don't think I've ever seen that. But, uh. <laughs> now, because of the intense bombardment, the effects of this on German cities and on German civilians is extraordinary. Uh, the British, by 1942 and into 43, are using incendiary bombs to create firestorms whose entire purpose is killing as many civilians as you can. That, that's not true. It's not the entire purpose. It is a purpose. You take out Hamburg. You take out Lübeck. You take out Leipzig. You, 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 you destroy everything that's destroyable and you move on. Uh, the early conclusion would be it would be very soon that the German morale would break. It didn't. 
but their cities are being leveled and their people are being killed in vast numbers, and this certainly does have a cumulative effect. Uh, you can see Colin here, uh, part of the railway si system, and then the cathedral standing in this middle of, you know, nothing. Uh, houses that are just, in this, in entire sections are just empty of people. This issue about killing civilians is, it's a big deal to me as a lawyer. It's a big deal to me, I think, probably as a person, and I don't really have a satisfactory answer for it. Uh, we say officially that we're not remotely doing this, that our bombers are so accurate that we're not targeting civilians. Um, General Aker, Commander Wraith Air Force, until he got fired later, uh, says that we're not going to, to use this weapon to kill innocent civilians in the street, but everybody knows that's what's going on. But if you don't do this, what's plan B? If you don't physically have a system that can ensure no civilian deaths or even minimal civilian deaths, what do you do? I mean, do you just shut the bomber force down? Uh, Curtis LeMay, we'll, we'll talk about him here in just, in just a little bit. With Curtis LeMay, you kind of know what you get every, every single time. It's sort of like if you have a Curtis LeMay doll and you push the button and you're going to get the recorded message about, yeah, drop the bomb, drop it, drop it now. He's, he's that guy. He says, and he's a smart man also, uh, who has made, he made statements a couple different times talking about the effect of war on civilians. And his point here is very simple. Uh, yeah, we're causing massive civilian deaths to women and children and, and everybody, and that's just sort of the price of doing business. Strategic bombing, I'm going to come back and we'll do the analysis or the effectiveness piece, and I'd like you maybe, you can be my jury, and you can tell me how you think we did. I do want to switch, though, to the war on the other side of the world, Japan. Very set, different set of circumstances, and the teething problems that we had in Europe that are so devastating to the crews that are flying there were simply not present in, in, the, in the Asian theater, for the most part. We're flying a different airframe, uh, the B-29, which never saw service in Europe, but it, it is, becomes the workhorse in the Pacific, and the circumstances are just very, very different. And it also allows me a chance to get back to my buddy Curtis LeMay, and you know, he's, he never is, you never run out of cool Curtis LeMay stories. <coughs> the B-29 is the biggest single expense of World War II. More money went into the B-29 development and production than went into the Manhattan Project for the atomic bombs. Uh, it is a, an aircraft that never ran out of things you could tinker with. Uh, I've got a friend of mine at work, and he's kind of the, like the world's B-29 expert, and I think there were like 45,000 production changes between the time the aircraft actually went into production and when it ceased production. Uh, it was years behind schedule. It was actually supposed to come out almost coincident with the B-17 and it didn't do that. It did kind of get a spurt of um, sense of urgency when General Hap Arnold went down to Wichita, Kansas to be there to do the ribbon cutting on the first B-29 that was coming off the line and it was going to fly and join the fleet. And after the general got down there, they told him that the B-29 wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what happened next? Uh, yeah, things got, you know, Hap's going to make sure that gets online. Um, so it doesn't fly again until September 1942, and it really doesn't get fully integrated into the air fleet until 43, 44. Um, for all the problems that it had with it, it is an incredibly powerful large aircraft, can hold much more in terms of tonnage than the B-17, and you can see just a comparison. It's just a much bigger airframe. Uh, the B-29 was also, unlike the B-17, which was an open aircraft, so like if you're the waste gunner on a B-17 and you're flying at 28,000 feet, it, it gets cold there. The B-29 is pressurized. 
Uh, but as it turns out, they discovered they didn't, that re almost wasn't necessary. It's fast, has a high ceiling, can go a long way, carries a lot of bombs, also a crew of 10. And one of the things that Curtis LeMay discovers in the Pacific, because that's where he goes next, is to run the campaign against Japan, is that all the worries we'd had with the B-17 with them protecting themselves. Okay, B-17 is covered with machine guns. I mean, you've got a belly turret, you've got, you got, up, you got upper turrets, you've got a tail gunner, you've got all kinds of machine guns. What they discovered, considering the Japanese air defense, was they didn't really need the machine guns at all. So most B on his order, almost every B-29 had its machine guns unshipped from the aircraft, uh, which also created a lot of excess personnel because now you really no longer really need the machine gunner. So you could make them do other stuff. It's flying high, it's flying fast, and Japanese air defense is not remotely the same as the German integrated air defense system. Uh, Japanese air defense in most cases is just visual. The Germans are using very, very sophisticated radar. Uh, they don't have it in Japan. And one of the things that they have in Japan that they don't have in Germany is an incredibly high percentage of buildings made out of wood. Curtis LeMay believes that Japanese industry has been decentralized and that most things produced for the war effort are being produced in private homes or very small factories located throughout the city. And because he believes this, although this is generally speaking not correct, which we learn later, uh, he is going to employ a version of what the British did in Europe, which is incendiary bombs um, and Japanese cities are just, they're going up like you've just poured lighter fluid on them. Tokyo, which is a massive, one of the most populated cities in the world, even in 1944-45, uh, you can see in terms of damage of, to the city, it's incredible. Uh, Kobe, Osaka, uh, Nagoya. Uh, that's not an atomic bomb. That's Tokyo. And that's just by conventional bombing and by firebombs. It is just like you have taken a scraper and just gotten rid of everything that was all the human habitation. Physical casualties uh, in their hundreds of thousands. Osaka, again, not an atomic bomb, just firebomb. So if you're comparing in terms of damage and devastation here, you know, Japanese cities to their, their U.S. equivalent, uh, firebomb in Tokyo would be the equivalent of destroying 51% of New York City. Uh, Kobe, the equivalent by size of destroying 55% of Baltimore and so forth. In terms of the Japanese strategic bombing campaign, the Curtis LeMay, it was, it was incredibly effective. 40% uh, of cities destroyed, 30% of the population lost their home, 330,000 civilian dead. So the idea that we're not going to be doing that, that, that just doesn't work out that way. Uh, 806 total casualties and Japanese combat deaths by comparison are 780,000. So looking at firebombing versus atomic bomb, in terms of what kills most people, it is by far firebombing, not atomic bombs. And Curtis LeMay um, says, you know, if he'd lost the war, he supposed he would have been tried as a war criminal, but the fact is that all war is immoral, and if you start thinking about that too much, it's not good because you can't do your job. So I do want to get one more thing with the atomic bomb here in a second. Um, how did we do? If we're talking the, the yardstick between the theory that we had in the 1930s of the way this thing is, is, is needs to go versus how it actually went, how would you, how would you, what kind of score would you give us? Like an A, a B, a C, D maybe? What do you think? 
and considering the scope of the thing, right? So let's go from 42 to 45. Not, okay, we concentrate just on October 43. We're, we're, we're in the D range. But the war as a whole, how do you think that's stacked up? <laughs> I, I, I got a lot of students who would be totally on board with that. Um, <laughs> what, what, let's do that then. What do you think, Pat? Do you think pass? Okay. But did this win it? Because remember the goal of strategic bombing. The Mitchell goal, the Douay goal, the Peter Strasser goal for that matter. Um, is it strategic in big S strategic in the sense that is it a war winner? Did strategic bombing win the war? Well, you can make the argument both ways. Uh, it didn't win the war up until August 1945. It could very well have been the thing that won the war on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's a plane, it's a bomb, it's dropped on a target, and a domino falls and you have an effect. And that effect was Japanese surrender on the USS Missouri. So is, how did strategic bombing do? Would Douay be happy with it? Would Mitchell be happy with it? Of course, he finally does get the Independent Air Force in 47, but, well, he didn't say that. How'd we do? Yeah. So this probably isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. You're exactly right. This isn't like, okay, it's going to work here, and it's going to work the same thing, same aircraft, same target set. is going to work perfectly someplace else. It's, it's kind of complicated. Um, but it's still part of what we do with war. This idea of center, a center of gravity or centers of gravity, if you like another definition, that there are certain things that if you can push them, if you can affect them, it's going to drop the dominoes in a way that's going to be helpful to you. So is that what winning looks like with strategic bombing? Mr. Mushroom Clap. Yeah. Because it's just not a one way street. No, sir. Yes. Well, value means you hit the industrial heartland, you hit the civilian population, and you make the war so painful for the opponent that he even made a first strike on you. He'll have ashes in his time. Well, and one of the things is, too, you can't hit all things all the time, so you're going to have to make some, some important choices. Uh, if you had to say which is the most important, is it ball bearings, is it fuel, is it command and control centers, is it oil production, is it a railroad marshalling yard, is it shipbuilding, which one is most important? In a perfect world, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, I've got a gazillion bombers and a gazillion bombs and a lot of crews and I can bomb everything tomorrow morning. But in the real world, it's choices. I can only bomb these things with this many planes, with this many tonnage this day what am I going to be able to do tomorrow, and is this going to have this cumulative domino effect that I'm hoping for? I, I don't know that you ever know. Yeah, yes, sir. In Europe, as ineffective, certainly, as the strategic bombing campaign was, I'm not sure what the alternative would have been, no. right? Because we, if we'd done nothing, we couldn't have probably hit it. Yeah, and, and one of the things, when the Air Force did the strategic bombing survey after the war, that was the question, is to what degree did this contribute to victory? Did it have an impact? A absolutely. I mean, by the, t the Germans are, are, their rail system is in a, a, a shambles. So again, even if you're producing all the fuel and all the planes and all the whatever, if you can't move it from here to here because you, I've just blown up your rail, that, that's all, that sounds awfully good to me. So it certainly had an effect, but trying to put that on a chart and do that is, is, is I, I don't even know how, if that's possible. Probably isn't. Sir? You know, you're, you're making a distinction. I mean, if you're talking about bomber Harris, 
Yeah. And the whole idea of just, you know, trying to level cities versus bombing rail junctions, that's a different level of strategic. I could almost argue that's tactical bombing. And I think the Air Force totally failed in tactical support in the Second World War and certainly since then. Well, uh, it, and you can make a case that, that certainly the so-called strategic bombing did not work in Bosnia, Sarajevo, had no work in the Balkans. If you have a dispersed economy, the Mideast, it's not going to work. No, no, you're exactly right. Like I said, it's not the one-use, all-use tool. I, I would argue, though, that, the, that most people credit strategic bombing with, with taking Milosevic out of power in Yugoslavia. Uh, I but would argue that by the, well, I'm sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. But in, in a case, though, whether it's strategic or tactical, the U.S. Air Force made the decision. They did both, but the, the primary effort and the primary resources were going to be devoted to strategic as opposed to tactical bombing. There were a couple of really unfortunate times when they tried to use B-17s as tactical bombers uh, in France in 1944, which mostly resulted in in Americans getting killed by American bombs. Uh, D-Day and, and after D-Day. And it what do you want your resources to do for you? The Germans had an air force that's almost entirely devoted to close air support, first of all. So they, and they're, they're really good at it. But they had they'd made that choice at the expense of having a bomber capability. So when London comes up in 1940, the Germans have the Heinkel 111, which is a light to medium bomber that's really unsuitable to the task. And it's too late to catch up. Where do you want to put your resources? We bet on you know Red Seven, uh, and as it turns out, the wheel stopped on. I mean, if it didn't stop on Red Seven, it kind of stopped on Red, maybe. So. Yes, sir. You may have already answered, but what uh, what was the German strategic bombing uh, plan, and how did it compare to? The they, Allies and, uh, they, they really never put one together. The, the Ger there was a German guy named, named Walter Weber who in the 1930s was their advocate for strategic bombardment. He gets killed, in, in, uh, not murdered, he just killed. With him, they lost their advocate. Uh, they don't have a platform and their attempts to develop one late. Uh, the Heinkel 177 runs into just a, a years and years of technical problems that they can't really get it done. And by that point, it's too late in the war for it to make a difference anyway. Had the Germans had a viable strategic bombing force in 1940 or 1941, maybe a different outcome. Yes, sir. Could you comment a little bit on the Japanese destruction of the Pearl Harbor fleet, almost destruction of the Pearl Harbor fleet as strategic bombing? I, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know if I would class that as strategic bombing. I think I may want to take, take that as maybe either tactical or operational. It, ha, it certainly, well, maybe not. Certainly yeah, and it certainly, ha, they're thinking the dominoes too, okay, that if I destroy the fleet here, what's going to happen next? Well, the happen next is going to eventually lead, they think, to the U.S. realizing it's just too expensive to go to war and not pursuing the war. Yes, it was. A ca a carrier base, carrier based naval aviation. Uh, so they, the ja and the Japanese too never had a heavy bomber. They had medium bombers, and they they didn't use those at Pearl Harbor. But it, it, that's a good question. Uh, pick pick me somebody. In, in the development of the strategy at the very beginning, sir. Everybody's sitting around a table yes. coming up with all these things. Was there any serious consideration given to losses of of our men and materiel? The assumption was, again, because of the numbers they went in with, the B-17 is going to, and the B-29 are going to fly so high and so fast, numbers will be negligible. And in fairness, on the B-29, losses were negligible. Uh, but there's so many things you can't figure out with a slide rule. And when they start going wrong, they, 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 they sometimes go really wrong. So, so the short answer to your question is that they had in no way had predicted losses of, of the kind they had. Um, were the uh, Allied attacks on German population centers uh, using strategic bombers simply payback for the uh, German attacks on population centers in the United Kingdom? 
Not as a one-to-one. -one. Uh, the reason that got started, when, like before the first attack on London, okay, the Germans had been bombing radar installations and some, some airfields in 1940. Uh, British bombers, a handful of bombers got through one night and bombed Berlin and didn't do any damage. But Hitler was so enraged by that that he ordered retaliation against London. There is kind of a tit-for-tat thing, I think, and I think that's what helped the British feel good about some of the stuff that happened later, is, hey, look, the Germans tried to do the same thing to us, but just, just couldn't pull it off. So. How does the uh, answers to the questions you raised about strategic assumptions, like the ability to uh, uh, identify and locate and hit and destroy targets apply to uh, the uh, Iranian nuclear program? It's a factor. I mean, if you're trying to take out anything, it's it's. The, know the answer to those questions about Iran, I guess, don't have. Well, I, I'll tell you just from from Mark Hall. Mark Hall does not know these things. <laughs> I, I I do not know. I, I'm I'm sure there are people that do. And they, we don't have lunch a lot, so they don't tell me these things. <laughs> <laughs> from the standpoint of the Japanese and the Germans, is it at all possible to assess? What more broke their back, the loss of strategic assets, or just the massive population destruction and destruction of cities? It, it's so hard to tell because there's so many factors. One of the things I think most people don't get about World War II is it's one on the Eastern Front. 75% uh, of German casualties, maybe, maybe is, it, is that about right, um, or Eastern Front. I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of the German army and, and, and the Air Force assets are on the Eastern Front. So this is where Germany just gets bludgeoned. And had that not been true, had Germany been able to shift, like, um, the same thing with even air defense. Okay, the German 88 anti-aircraft gun that's, that's around Berlin waiting for an American bomber to show up is an 88 aircraft gun that's not killing tanks on the Russian front. So, so it depends. It depends on how you want to adjust the, the statistics. But if there's a massive casualty among civilians, yes. Doesn't that undermine the argument of strategic bombing? Well, not not if you count on that as is your effect. So if you're if you're like Douay and you're like some other people in the system later, if you're counting on that to be that spark that's going to lead to to enemy's destruction, this is perfectly in line with what you want. And maybe their theory is we just didn't do it long enough or, or, or enough of it. Uh, keep keep going, and Germany's going to have to break if you kill enough of their people. Excuse me. Berlin surrendered when it was occupied by the Red Army. Nothing to do with how many billions of casualties. Well, certainly. In terms of this, oh 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 oh. oh. Uh, Dr. Gurgis, who normally is not allowed to ask me any questions, is, has got a question. <laughs> is, it, is, is, it, is, this, is this something you couldn't have done at lunch today? No, because okay. I, was, I was wondering about, you, you backed me in the corner about to defend the Germans, because weren't they successful strategic bombing if you look at what they designed their Air Force to do, this Central European fight that they expect to fight their neighbors, like, I don't know, the Netherlands, well, and they knock them out with strategic bombing Rotterdam, it's when you take it on the road, and they are very close in Great Britain, except they change the target from going after the Air Force to going after the I, population. I think, it's, I, I think it's a fair point. But like with Rotterdam, actually, the Dutch had surrendered before the city was bombed. And that was a big deal in the war, cri war crimes later, which is they, Rotterdam is thought of this, this, this atrocity. The Germans didn't, the air guys didn't get the word that the surrender had already taken place, and they bombed it anyway. I think Germany, for the most part, is, is really, it, the Luftwaffe likes to live in tactical or tactical operational world. Um, and it just, it just didn't quite ever have the means, or I think, or the intent, really, to, to, to make strategic. It was, it was close, because certainly if you're a betting person in 1940, or even early through mid-1941, if you had to figure out who's going to win this thing, it, it's probably going to be Germany. Sir. How much was the national culture taken into account? Because if you look at Japan, 
those people would have fought to the fact that there wasn't anybody left. Yes. Whereas in Germany, they wouldn't have done that. They would have had a more honorable way out and say, I surrender. But that's not a part of the Japanese culture. I, I, and and that's, a, that's an enormous part of the debate about the atomic bomb. Uh, drop it or don't drop it. How many casualties, how many, what, the, what would the Japanese have done? How many U.S. casualties, how, how many Japanese casualties would have been? I, I'm really glad we didn't have to find out. Yeah. But, and, Greg? And I, 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 would, I would add, relative to 1945 in Germany, let us not forget what, what had to ha happen in order for Berlin to be taken. So, you know, the Germans did fight to the end. Hitler organized a police state in order to assure that they would stay in the war to the end. We had boots on the ground in every portion of Germany before the final surrender pretty much took place. So, you know, would they have surrendered before? Well, we had to take it. One of the reasons you dropped this is in part you've spent the money on building an atomic weapon. Would you want to be a president after the war if we had to invade Japan and find out that we had this thing and it didn't get used? That's, you know, there are a lot of things that move into the decision. I don't want to say that was the only one of them, though. But the other, the other thing not to forget about the atomic bomb is that Russia entered the war and was, uh, was punching through Japanese armies in, in, in uh, China. Uh, they're also going to invade the northern Japanese islands, and there's vast concern among the decision makers there of that, that we will be that we will be occupied that we will be occupied. We focus on those two events. They certainly play a role, but they're not the only thing that enters in even to the final surrender in Japan. That's not what the Air Force will tell you when the war's over, though. If we'd had the atomic bomb, this could have worked, and 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 that's the kind of take-home message moving forward in the 1950s. Okay. Sir. Sure. Yes. With Germany, <clears throat> you basically, uh, this has probably been said already in a different way, but you basically had to cut the head off the snake and, you know, and you win that war. With Japan, it wasn't necessarily so. Uh, I really do believe that they would have fought to literally almost to the last person. Well, <clears throat> but the head of the stake is still important, which is the only, when Japan surrenders is when the emperor goes on the radio and says, we are surrendered. Uh, he de his, his language, I was re actually reading the text of that a couple weeks ago, and his language is really funny. Because it isn't beaten, it isn't, uh, the way he's presenting it to the Japanese people essentially is, I have decided to do this, therefore we do this. Not that we were getting clubbed bad. Um, but I think whether it's Hitler <coughs> in, in Germany or, or Hirohito in, in Japan, I think that's, Ultimately, war is a political act, and the political decision is the one that counts. I fight, I surrender, I... Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is in basically late winter, early spring, 1944, Ike comes in and says, you guys are now going to be used to, in fact, support the invasion. Yes and massive amounts of the strategic, the tactical and operational air forces go in to take out the transportation grid supporting the German Wehrmacht in France. And it effectively sets up a situation where the Germans can't sustain their combat power, they can't move it. Right. And although Normandy is a close call, the question of the buildup and then breakout, suddenly we find ourselves in a combination of air and ground power into operational maneuver that none of the planners in shape actually thought was possible. We get to Paris, what was it supposed to be, 240 days after the invasion, we're there in less than six weeks. Well, although the flip side of that is kind of funny too because like U.S. forces set foot on German soil in September 44. Yeah. Uh, I can drive to Berlin from the border near Aachen in about five hours. It took us eight months. So even if you're, even like, the reason Hiroshima and Nagasaki get bombed is not because, uh, even the reasons that were given at the time, the fact is they're both about the only two cities left in Japan that have not been substantially attacked. So if you're looking to do a test of the atomic bomb, 
you need a, a test site. Uh, Germany, by this point, you know, by March 45, the, the Army Air Force essentially had suspended strategic bombing because there were no German cities of any size left to above 50,000 that hadn't been hurt or destroyed. So there is a cumulative effect. How much it is, I, I, I really can't say. But even with all of that, even with the power of the Army Air Forces and the Army, it's still taking you eight months to, to punch through. Germans aren't giving it up. Also yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I agree. The I agree. The whole problem of trying to get from bridgehead. The Germans hold every port city so that sure. in terms of finding some way to get stuff ashore rapidly and effectively restoring the French rail system, getting pipelines, it's going to take time. Sure. And, and even in World War II, until, until Antwerp and the shelter cleared, you, you're, you're hauling stuff from Normandy. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, in, in, in no respect was any part of this war easy for anybody. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Well, let, let me. I'm going to wait and thank you for a second. Good. Mm -hmm. Was it intentional that they had big Jewish people you seven up there to be the Lawrence guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Because uh, <laughs> if if it was going to be my druthers, it would be probably a San Francisco guy. But but I'll, I'll take that. It, yes, it was. I, I, I'm a, that's, that's why. Uh, thank you, and I really do mean this for your very kind attention. Uh,